All right, welcome back to House Hacking with Helper, and this is episode two, Alex. We got some feedback on episode one. I was told that we were so goddamn boring that we had to bring in some special guests. Or liven it up a little bit. Let me know when he gets to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so speaking of which, Alex, why don't you go ahead and introduce our uh, esteemed guest today? Today we got Gabe Forsett on podcast, uh, co founder, Campbell Street Asset Management, founder of Base3, um, good friend, uh, great investor, and uh, has a lot of experience to share with us. So, um, so, yep, take it away. Just, just thank you for having me, and guess we're good friends, but no, I'm joking. We're only good friends with Alex when he finds good deals. Yeah, which is uh, well, it is very often. And he's only friends with us when we're buying. I've, I've cracked the code. Exactly, exactly. No, it's another be here. I've really uh, admired both you guys, and it's it's a treat to, to be here. Share some of my knowledge and experience. Sit in and um, I hope that this can be helpful to, to you guys. Um, you know, I can start by just introducing myself. Um, I've been in the real estate business now for about 20 years. I got my real estate license when I was 19, living in Wisconsin, attending you to Madison, doing a real estate program. Uh, I received a degree in finance and real estate uh, from the business school and pretty much started working in real estate in the early age. I was a carpenter, a bricklayer. I was actually working on job sites, believe it or not, cleaning, cleaning up uh, messes and helping set up bricks, scaffolding, et cetera. And then I um, worked for a golf I was in school and went on to be a banker. So I had some real good fortune and state experience, worked for Wells Fargo Bank for seven years. And then um, started buying properties at a very early age. Uh, started at 23 years old, I got my first property. So, uh, and since then, I've grown to have larger portfolio of rental properties, um, over 50 buildings, near a full on 500 apartments. Career. Take us back to that 23-year-old uh, Gabe that bought his first property. Okay, so I, I my hair was thicker, and I was about 25 pounds less to give you perspective, but uh, certainly not as wise as I am the help on I me. Mean. So I knew that I wanted to buy real estate since I was a little boy. I actually uh, wrote uh, an, an article when I was 12 years old at a time it was 20 years later, if it was 32, I would be a real estate developer. Everyone knows on we adopt her, we are, but I always knew that this is something I was passionate about. And uh, I was always playing tools to kid, super fascinated with investments, construction. And so uh, what was working my corporate job at Wells Fargo Bank, it's pretty cushy banker job, four hours a week, learning finance, learning how the borrower would go in to get a loan to build or a property building or build retail center or industrial property. I had some spare time on my hands, and instead of you know, hanging out, watching football on my weekends, I would uh, actually go and look at the property. Got my real estate license here in Chicago, and a uh, good college friend and I was over the cross of a four flat in, uh, in Lake to you, and we're able to buy the property, and um, we split the down payment, and I believe we pay around $800,000 for the property. It was four units. Owner-occupied? Uh, you know, so funny story about that, and the plan was for us to each take an apartment, and then he ended up meeting his wife. And so that got a little complicated. And so while well, my original plan was to actually occupy the building, um, the rents ended up being so high that I actually never moved into the property. So while well, that was my intention, I actually never followed through with it. I'd have fun to live in other buildings I owned and managed, but um, it was just kind of funny. You just look at doing the math on him. What are you paying the rent? At that time, I was you know, King 3, sharing a perfect paying $600 a month. And the rents on this building were about 13 or month for two dead one bath. And so I basically just did the math. I'm like, well, I could live with my buddies and never move and just wreck this seat out. And um, what's funny about that property, that was 2008. Uh, so that was uh, over 14 years ago. The rent on that first unit has gone from $13 a month to almost $3,000. And I think that's still on it. Still on it. Yeah. And I'm still fixing it up. I'm actually added in garden parking. There was telling you I actually fell on a hole at the job site this morning. So I kind of hurt my neck a little bit. Well, it's a dangerous uh, job. We but I, I do still own that. And what was interesting about that property is because I bought it right. My first partner on in that building in the first six months of owning it, say we bought it for $800,000 because we bought it at less than market value. 
Uh, six months later, we actually had it appraised for 950000 So in the first six months, we were able to take our initial $600,000 mortgage with $200,000 of equity down, and we are actually able to put a new loan for $715,000. And so what was really exciting about that is it created a capital event that was actually tax-free, and it allowed us to then own a $950,000 market value asset for $75,000, give or take. So what's crazy to me, your first sort of uh, real estate move, right, outside of brokering and studying, or whatever, your first purchase, you could almost say it was a home run, right? So one, uh, at least a double. One thing I know Alex and I talked about a few weeks ago, and I talk about with a lot of people, making sure one move leads to the next move. And if you're, fr I think a lot of the folks out there, their concern is if that first move is a loss, your real estate career might be over. So do you think you kind of stumbled into that or was it a matter of you were just so meticulous and careful with your search or what How sort of lens did you see before you fought that one? I think that we looked at over 50 buildings, less than 75. Um, I'm a very analytical person and real estate is a numbers game. Um, it involves, uh, you know, looking at a basic Excel spreadsheet was actually funny is my initial Excel spreadsheet I put together for this property. Today, I can probably recreate in under two minutes. It did have a management fee. It didn't have full underwriting. It was basically, all right, I had four partners that rented me for $60,000 a year. If one of them was vacant because I'm living in it, what is my remaining expenditure? What's my property taxes, my insurance? I'm going to presumably self-manage and keep the maintenance costs low. I'm going to shout snow. You know, I was really with this with guy who's still a good friend of mine, a weekend warrior, where we would go in, paint the units, clean the hallways. It would be definitely got my hands dirty. Lost a lot of weight to weekends in my youth, but I actually also really enjoyed doing it. It's very stability. Um, but I started with a really unsophisticated model. And I remember at the time, this was an old beat before the market came crashing down. The way I looked at it was, okay, condominiums are selling for around three or thousand dollars a unit. And they're approximately this big, this building, 200,000 unit is approximately this big. And I was able to look at the relative value and understand my basis just in lay terms, like if a condo was selling for 400 grand and I can buy a unit that could be of somewhat comparable value or size for a 20 to 30 percent discount that economically makes sense and that's really the key to having a first successful transaction um the father of the real estate program at edb madison uh, is famous for saying you make all of your money on on property transactionally be it buying retail buying a parking building buying your house any money that is made, you make out buy because it is the only part of that transaction you can truly control. You can decide the purchase price, the terms of closing, and all those other details, uh, but you can never dictate what happens after that exactly. You can plan uh, you know, for budgets and performance, but no one has a crystal ball, and I think that's the most interesting thing when you look at investing a long-term horizon. You look at the historical trends of rent growth and inflation, and it's funny, up until about 12 or 24 months ago, I never envisioned that rents would ever start growing in Chicago and be stagnated. It might have been quite bad. And now we're seeing a year where we're seeing a commensurate amount of rent growth in 12 months that we had previously seen in the previous four or five years. No one can ever predict that, but what you can predict is that at the long run, it does this where you have an x-axis and a graph that basically says time from acquisition, you know, at the base of that axis, uh, it's the day you buy it. And then over time going along the x-axis, it's just going up years and years and years. And like, great, does this over time. And inflation does this over time. And as you're doing that and the building is doing this, your mortgage is doing this. And that spread you're creating is essentially your equity. And something that I, I, I get advice to people that I mentor, and I love seeing young people with an interest in this, and I encourage anyone that ever wants to follow the, um, my email is gave at base3co.com. Um, I think it'll be in the information on the podcast, but just to ask questions and find people to talk to about that, because no one can ever predict what the future will hold. And like I said, my first property, I read some 
over 300% of course for two more uh, 14 years. So long, um, it's hard to say future goals, but um, it's definitely not an overrated. So. Well, here's my question though, <clears throat> without getting too much into exactly, we, you know, we all come from different backgrounds and have invested, some have investors, some don't, whatever. If we go back to that first property and, and you didn't have that, um, uh, that cash creating event, right? The re the refi basically, mm -hmm. does that change your story? If you had, if you know, if we did the sliding doors movie, if you if you had to go back and let's just say the crash happened a little sooner, right? Uh -huh. you, you probably you probably were a couple months away from having a whole different story. So if that first one, if you weren't able to refi, get your cash back, whatever you were able to manipulate there, how did take us? How do you think that looks? I think that's a, that's a great question, and, and why do you ask that? Because part of how I analyzed that project and how I've subsequently analyzed you know, well over a hundred million dollars of other property acquisitions since was basically looking at real estate from the standpoint of it is fundamentally a liquid, meaning it's not like a stock concealed like a bond where you can go on your trade income, click the button. Um, now some buildings are more liquid than others, but some buildings can have a normal marketing time of six to 12 months if you're lucky and it's subject to change and interest rates and other, you know, other factors in the economy totally outside your control. Um, but the way that I looked at that property initially is I had no idea I would have the cash offered finance or capital met. I basically said, if I'm putting in this much capital, I need to assume that the capital is tied up indefinitely. And if the capital was tied up indefinitely, can I look up that scenario? And that's when I tell people that have invested with me, partnered with me, done various talk ventures with me is assume that this money is tied up. Do not put in money that you're going to need at six to 12 months. But if you can create a base assumption in your analysis that if your money is tied up indefinitely, can you make a respectable return that outpaces what you might return and uh, return yourself in an alternate or alternative investment? And in my case, I remember on that property, my thinking was that if I could make at least eight percent and tie the money up cash on cash, and then pay the principal down and get to around twelve percent. I would be happy with that. Or if I could buy the building, live for free, pay down the principal, and look at the property in a long-term basis back on some appreciation, that would be okay too. But what I wanted to make sure wouldn't happen is I would buy the property, not be able to have a place to live for free, helps offset subsidize my costs, and, uh, and have to feed the property huge amounts of money, and definitely we're able to put feeders with straight earnings. So, when you find something that works and the numbers work, you know, and you just need to have a little bit of method and, uh, and time to keep them going. Yeah. When time is the key can kind of exactly most, most of your deals, how long would you say you, you own them for like what's, and what's the plan usually going to, them? is it a five-year-old, seven-year-old indefinite hold? Like how many have you bought? How many have you sold? Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a great question. You know, <laughs> It's it kind of silly for me to say this out loud, but because I started buying so young, I never thought I'd ever want to sell anything. And then all of a sudden with blank and you're in your mid to late thirties, you're like, no, it'd be nice to buy a house or start a family or do other things that if you start early enough, they'll make the rest of your life a little bit easier, more comfortable. So you can have financial flexibility to do those things. Uh, a lot of people look at investments on a five set of a 10 year horizon. That's why you'll often find that mortgages for commercial properties, especially bigger or property investments are five set of 10 year turns. Um, what's nice about doing an owner occupied property is that for a two to four unit building, you can potentially get a non business own and lock in a 30 year mortgage with no pre and pal penalty and a lot of flexibility. Um, but I would say out of these 60 some odd projects I've done, I've only sold about 10 of them just because I believe in the long term aspect of selling. Um, you know, and the thing about so many properties is there's a lot of transaction costs associated with that. And so you potentially take a hit on your balance sheet on the value if you're selling a property and paying fees and closing costs and maybe even taxes if you're not doing a 1031 tax deferred exchange. Uh, at the exit of the property, but um, so talk a little bit about that 1031 exchange. How does that work? A lot of people, yeah, that's it's another great question. Um, so 1031 exchange, I don't know when it exactly came out, but I think it was introduced in the 80s. 
when it was going through a really challenge of time economically, it was basically done, I believe, to spur growth and investors in the private sector to help stabilize the first real estate market. Uh, a tech and war exchange is basically a tax strategy that allows you to sell a property that you've owned for a year a day and makes it classified as a long-term hold, much like a stock. So if you want a stock and you sell it in under 365 days, I'm not a CPA or consultant. But if you want less than a year, it's short-term gain, same as property. But if you want a property for a year and a day, it's considered a long-term hold. So investing in real estate can become incredibly tax efficient because in a scenario where you're in a property more than a year, you could potentially sell the property, realize a gain, and basically take the building value that you sold for and the equity that you've created it and roll it into another crop or tax free. So hypothetically, in a scenario where you bought a building for a million dollars is two hundred thousand dollars down, and a year later you sell for a million two a year later today, again consult your CPA or a 1031 expert. A year and a day later, you can basically take that million two, put it into a building of equal or greater value to a million two, and you have two hundred thousand dollars profit and two hundred thousand dollars original equity. If you put that in the property, you can pay nothing on that gate. And then, if you are able to do that again or create incrementally more value on the next transaction, you can put your debt on it and take all your profit that you've created out tax free. Can that be an owner occupied property? Uh, I believe it can be. It, it, it really depends on the situation. But there's a lot of creative ways to involve CPA or 1031 exchange intermediary to basically grow your wealth in a very tax efficient, for sure, thought, with a tax free in some instances manner. Um, and that's, that's, it's really incredible. As someone who's a real estate professional and you're able to get this tax status, and I'm sure it's something you guys enjoy. I was actually just on the phone yesterday with the CPA working with one of my good friends and business partners. He has a lot of ordinary income in non-real estate business. And if he is able to uh, show that he is putting an equal or greater amount of time into the real estate business as he is in the other non-real estate business, he can get a real estate tax status benefit, meaning that he can all of a sudden take advantage of appreciation on investments, accelerated cost segregation. Um, like I said, it's a very tax efficient strategy. Investment strategy, I highly recommend it. But no need to go super deep down that rabbit hole. That's uh, that's real estate too. Yeah, we've we've multiple times had to grab ourselves out of that. We'll get into it though. Depreciation is something I I would like to learn more about from my own portfolio. But I want to ask you a question. So I, I'm very uh, I'm intrigued by kind of where you started from and when you started. So compare the market conditions then to you and I today looking for multi-unit property, what challenges would you say are more prevalent now or are there advantages now compared to when you started? Um, Cause it's, I'd imagine it's two totally different marketplaces. Yeah, that's actually another really interesting question. Um, what I think is curious about the state of the world and the market today is that like in 2006, seven, we had very low interest rates, overweight, borrowing rates were super low. And then there was a very significant Fed uh, interest rate hike, much like what's happening now. So hand mortgage rates are going from uh, relatively you know, low number, and even for commercial front and fill, it was three, four percent. Money is now going up to five and a half, six and a half, even seven percent. And so when interest rates go up, it puts downward pressure on uh, values. Now, where this could, I think, potentially present an opportunity is that a lot of people that have been looking to buy buildings or get started are going to be potentially, you know, weeded out or thinned out of the herd. Uh, because it is hard to make the numbers work. When you put everything in your little format, then you start having to write a, an interest rate of five and a half, six and a half, seven percent. You cannot afford to pay the same in the home for that same property. However, I think there's a lot of similarities, parallels between that time and now, because like last time, there was a for sale housing boom where a lot of people were taking advantage of historically low rates, much like has happened over the last 12, 24, 36 months. 
And now those those housing costs to purchase single family home are making single family home purchases much less achievable and attainable and reasonable for a lot of people out there. Sure. Just because you know, mortgages that might have been six grand a month with property taxes, P and I, everything is now maybe upwards of eight thousand eighty five hundred. And so if you have the capital and you have the gumption to go out and buy a multi unit building, uh, you're going to see that while your cost to borrow might be higher, we're also going to see higher revenue in, in terms of rent. And so I think it's a very exciting time to be a landlord because rents are finally on. And that's basically what I experienced in 2008. Mortgage rates have gone up significantly. Fewer people were buying. I think it, it provided you know, more opportunity because it's simple supply and demand economics that if there's fewer buyers out there, like, Prices will go round for multi-family, single-family, anything in that market. And then, as as fewer people are buying, right, you know, more people are renting, and that's you know, history is going to keep repeating itself. And it, one piece of advice I mean, I like people to take away from this is that this is a long-term business, and it is a business of patience. And I remember when I was out there looking for my first property, I moved to Chicago when I was six. I started day one, like scouring the earth for, for the right investment property. And it took me a year and a half of real, real dedicated search. And it wasn't until the intrigue was about to collapse that something finally clicked and the numbers made sense. Um, you know, and then leading up into that point, rents were relatively low, more people were buying, people were going crazy in the counter conversion market, especially in Chicago. So that was reducing inventory of rentals because now they were being converted to ownership and or, you know, for sale owners. And down um, it resulted in a pretty significant surge in rental price. I mean, I think during the country, you saw brands grow on average between five to eight percent annually for around potentially it might have been thirty-six to forty-eight months. So and again, that's the thing, like the returns are levered by both your operating expenses and your debt payment. And still operating levers of the concept of the business that if you have a certain amount of revenue and fixed expenses and your revenue goes up, it mostly goes to the bottom line. Now that can work in, in reverse where revenue goes down, your expenses are fixed, your bottom line cash flow or that operating leak can go to zero. But um, the same is true now on a rental growth period where let's say hypothetically that fourth flat I bought is rented for, and I bought it for $60,000 a year. I have hypothetically $30,000 of payment expenses. It's just to make things simple. Sure. So that results in basically revenue, less expenses, principal payment, interest payment, and mortgage payment. 60000 minus 30000 with results for conversation's sake, and $30,000 we are from that cash flow. If I keep my operating expenses and mortgage payments fixed, 30000 and all of a sudden, rents went from sixty thousand a year up to ninety thousand a year, which happened over the course of about thirty six, forty eight months. All of a sudden, my net cash flow and my bottom line doubles, and that's the power of leverage. It can work against you, but when you look at the historical norms of owning property, inflation, and ripple growth, it's it's fairly unlikely that it is going to go off. I want to talk about one way how that could uh, let, let's stick with that same example. How pressure could come from the other side. Let's talk about taxes in Chicago, mm -hmm. and that's a hot topic right now. How has that affected? Cause that could change your, that that thirty thousand dollar number, right? Oh and yeah, all of a sudden, like so there's a lot of discussion right now about how taxes could potentially make some of these deals unviable anymore. How's that affecting your strategy? Uh, so yeah, yeah. In response to your question about property taxes in the city of Chicago and Cook County generally, it's Definitely in here with concern, and it's funny, since I started buying property in 2008, there's always been the discussion of, you know, the, the chickens coming home to roost, uh, that there's a major tax liability in the city of Chicago, and that is, you know, the, a marlating to a lot of people. Some of our counterparts, our investor counterparts, are leaving the city because of this. This is I'm, I'm not just bringing this up because it's fun to talk about. No, people have stopped true. buying. I feel like you're you're continuing. You're you're here, right? How are you preparing for these tax events, and what methods are you using to you know underwrite with you know some conservative nature? Yeah, those are those are other excellent questions. Um, so 
Underwriting in itself is basically the process of making a pro forma, which assumes revenue, expenses, and then a mortgage payment resulting in cash flow. And if you back out the mortgage payment, there results in that operating income. So it is a rule of thumb. We've been underwriting the taxes, building up on a higher percentage of gross revenue. I remember when I started buying property, I assumed that the property taxes would only be about 10% of gross revenue. Uh, unfortunately, that's no longer the case. Uh, on new projects, especially in some of the ground up developments I've been working on, it's more like class A quality, new construction. Those tend to be taxed higher. Um, and on those, I'm typically underwriting between 15 to 17%. Really just depends. Um, on some of the smaller properties, I continue to underwrite conservatively between 13 to 15%. What's um, odd about, and not odd, but interesting to look at in terms of property tax strategy in Cook County is that despite all the doom and gloom and the fear of peddling on property taxes of completely out of control, if you have a good property tax management strategy and a good tax attorney, for sure, that is a great uh, tool to help mitigate any of the pain for property taxes. Um, what I think is quite interesting about property taxes in Cook County is the lack of predictability. Um, just an interesting anecdote I'll share with you. Uh, I have a, I'll just say generically, a 20 unit apartment built. Uh, on the north side, it's a good bill land. And to say hypothetically, to conversation, say it generates thirty thousand dollars of gross annual revenue. Using the parameters I just described, and going in to underwrite that property, I would say three hundred thousand dollars of gross revenue. The property taxes should be around one fifty. I'm a numbers guy. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not one fifty. They would be around forty five thousand. So fifteen percent of of three hundred grand. That property and several properties like it are actually being taxed at closer to 10%. And just recently, the assessments came on. It was a big mess. It was very delayed. It's been very challenging for a lot of owners, investors, and property tax attorneys. But when I look at my real estate schedule and the blended average of my taxes, it actually is shaking up to be over 20, 25% less than the high water mark I'm describing. Because if you have enough property, it's sort of balancing out that I have some properties that are being, in my opinion, overtaxed at 18% gross, and then I have some cap properties that I would argue are being undertaxed at 6% gross. Um, I may mean, get into the details, but there's some properties that I think are just being totally mishandled, and unfortunately, it's it's hard to predict that. Yeah. Um, doesn't have a lot to do with the purchase price, too. Like a lot of the properties that you're buying are. You're not buying stabilized properties, right? You're buying properties that you're going in, you're renovating, so you're getting for a lower cost versus what it's worth in the end. But the tax assessor doesn't know how much money you put into it or. Yes. Because there's no sale. There's no sale. Yeah, even that, that's correct. I mean, that's what's so strange about the whole system. I think what has turned a lot of people off, and I know that the predecessor, uh, whose goal coming in, he's an elected official, as you guys know. His goal coming into this was to create transparency in the actual process so that institutional investors and any investor for that matter, nationally, locally, regionally, could look at Chicago and have a little bit of predictability because in many instances, it feels like it's kind of a crash sheet. Uh, but then also, some of the taxes just don't really add up. And again, I've had properties where taxes come in at a fraction of what they should be in their hand alders where they come in a third higher. Uh, my advice to anyone buying a property, be it as an investor or it is a, you know, holder hack, uh, older occupant, is to find a good tax attorney. They will give you free counsel. They eventually charge based on a percentage of the savings. But uh, most sophisticated and organized real estate investor owners, even occupant or occupants or homeowners, engage a tax attorney in the city of Chicago or County for that matter because they're able to advocate for you and get relief. Uh, but it's just it, the way that I, I am able to get comfortable at the property tax situation is that overall, I feel like rents are trending upwards. And because of the operating leverage I described, if I can have rents, let's say, again, not hypothetical, $60,000 a year of rental revenue, let's say $30,000 of taxes, let's say that scenario of taxes are 15 grand. So if taxes go from 15 grand to 20 grand, 
how much more does the rent have to go up to offset that one to one? And the, I, I want to tap into that. This is actually to both of you guys. So <clears throat> let, let's catch us up to today. So, you know, Gabe, as you described, rents have been going up. Okay. Interest rates have been going up. Taxes are going up. So we're getting some, that pressure I'm talking about coming this way. The only way to offset that, right, to, to make our numbers worse to is going to be go for up. rents mm -hmm. to continue to go up. Mm -hmm. What I want your guys' opinion on is how it, I feel like values have not adjusted yet. How do you guys think valuations of multifamily property are going to adjust to higher interest rates and higher taxes? I mean... I mean, rents are going up, so that the hell. I don't believe they're going to go up enough in this coming year to offset the change in rates. I think it's the rates, but it's also one thing you missed is the construction cost. That's right? a so great like, point. I look at like. Trust me, I don't miss that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I look at like what it costs to like replacement cost, right? Um, as 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 a component of that. So I think yeah, I think rents next year will will continue to see a strong rear if rates stay high. Um, but if interest rates stay high, then your know, values will probably, you know, you know, stay pretty much where they're at. Um, so for people who are looking to do the whole cash out refinance strategy, um, and they bought a year or two ago when the rates were at four, now they're at six and a half, seven on, um, you know, it's not, it's not just what the building is worth. In terms of what it will sell for, it's what the bank will appraise it for. So I think my building's worth two and a half million. The bank's saying, no, it's worth 2.2. All of a sudden, the refinance becomes not a good strategy. So it is a, a year where I wouldn't really count on, you know, refinancing and re levering everything because um, it just might not be. Well, Mike, I, I, I'm wondering as we all go, you know, when we leave here in 10 minutes and we all go search for deals. Are we going to start seeing some of that affect the the purchase price? The purchase price on the on the entry, right? So, so so far, I feel like we've kind of been hanging out in limbo a little bit here the last few months, right? We haven't seen sellers necessarily start to realize that the 2020 2021 prices are not are no longer going to work, quite frankly. So, I'm I'm yet to see them give. Investors are yet to give and, and truly believe that we could keep pushing upwards. So we're kind of in the, doing this little limbo right now where I feel like activity level is just low. Are you seeing, I mean, you're, you're the boots on the ground. It's low. I mean, there's, you know, it was a handful of deals, you know, uh, uh, yeah, long-term, you know, long-term ownership, right? They're always create some sort of deals, people moving on to the next chapter in their life and, uh, but in terms of like, you know, compared to a year ago, it's, it's, it's definitely slow. So we're kind of in that in between period where we need to go one way or the other. It needs to become, you know, more efficient for the buyer or, we'll, you know, one way or the other. We're kind of stuck in two right now. What do you think? What do you think is coming in the next yeah. year? Yeah. Well, so one thing you touched on it, uh, was that the bank won't value the property and the issue really more than valuation right now on appraisals of recent cases is actually not so much necessarily focused on the value, it's more on coverage level. Yeah. Meaning that the, the debt service, the mortgage payment has gone up so much because of this rise rates that let's say a building that is worth five million that you're into for four million dollars and you were banking on that four million dollar cash out, the bank is now looking at that saying, well the value is there, but I can only put one than three million one to three point three to leave because that's what we're going to be at a one one five and into a two debt service coverage. Debt service you, coverage being can we back out DC, DCR? Yeah, so debt service coverage is basically the equation uh, where the numerator is the net operating income, so the revenue minus the expenses of the property uh, before the mortgage payment, and that number divided by the mortgage payment is uh, is the debt service coverage ratio. So. Um, and what are most banks, what are you finding they're looking for right now? 25? They're looking for 115 to 125. It depends on whether you're providing a personal guarantee on the property or whether you're getting non-recourse debt. Um, a whole nother rabbit hole we could go down another time. But uh, just to 
you know, back that into an example, if you have $120,000 of net operating income and $100,000 mortgage payment, uh, you are covering a one, one to two, uh, I'm sorry, 1.2 uh, covered ratio. And so if that mortgage payment all of a sudden creeps up to $110,000, you're no longer covering on that ratio and the bank is going to have to scale down the, the, the loan proceeds. I think that right now, what is significantly offsetting that is the amount of capital out there. There is so much capital in the market. And I think something that people are becoming more aware of is the effect of the trillions of dollars of money that was created in our financial system following COVID and the amount of money that made its way to business owners for PPP. I mean, we all know and have heard of people getting a million dollar plus counts when their business is operating despite and some of those business owners are saying, gee, I got a million dollars of cash. Basically the government gave me is a forgivable wall. A million dollars of cash. Right. I think in some instances tax rate, I don't know how it was treated, but those people now want to put that into an investment class that will hedge against inflation and will generate stable cash flow. I mean, a lot of investors and people that I've worked with are pretty big in the stock and bond market and they're tired of the volatility, you know, and while the real estate market can have some volatility and there's some volatility in interest rates, if you're long-term and you have a well-located property that will attract stable renters, you can have pretty predictable cash flow. And by way of example, the first building I bought over the course of 14 years, I don't think I had more than a three or four months of any extended vacancy. It's had consistent collections. I think my collection loss less than 1%. So I think there's so much equity out there. And while rates have gone out, allowing for less borrowing, what that ultimately results in historically is a period of deep leverage. Where if I see a property, I really want to own long-term and they think I can, you know, pitch an investor on why it's a good value to point to investment. We may say, you know what, well, we historically could borrow 80% of the cost, meaning for every million dollars to purchase eight or a thousand dollars long short sure, rent equity. Maybe we now look at that deal and say, well, rents are going up, feels still like a good deal. Now we're going to put down 30%, 70% loan to costs and basically have a lower leverage property. And then the long-term hope is that as rates come down when the values go up, we'll be able to refinance and fair returns might be later. But it's a long term game and nothing unless you're really lucky happens a free aid. Got it. So for the you know, for the new investor, you know, let's say they've got, you know, a hundred thousand dollars saved up and they have another partner with a hundred thousand dollars. So they have two hundred thousand dollars for a down payment. What if you were getting started today, what are you looking for? Where are you looking for it um, to get, get your portfolio to sell you? Yeah, uh, that's another amazing question. I, I think that it really depends on what your risk tolerance is and how much time you have. You know, I was fortunate that I had a corporate job that allowed me a lot of free times on nights and weekends. And what you've just described is basically the situation I was in with uh, my friend that I bought my first uh, building with. I think that you will have the biggest upside doing it yourself instead of investing with someone else. But you just have to ask yourself, like, what is your time worth? And like, you know, do you have family do you have other major commitments? And I think that's why it's exciting. It's something I admired about you, Alex, since you started so dummy and just throwing costs into the community and, uh, and just kind of going for it. And that's, you know, one of the biggest pieces of advice I give to young people is just buy a building. Find a way, buy a building, get a lawn, you can do it. And I think once you start realizing that if you have a stable job, you have decent credit, you find a way to, to raise the equity, you borrow it and raise it, you get creative, you get a loan for FHA at 97% cost. There's a way to do it. And then you can personally add value. You know, if you're investing in a bigger deal, there would be management fees, there would be other expenses outside the control. But if you're you know, doing smaller projects or even bigger projects with yourself matching, you're able to keep the expenses more of me and have a higher not operating income and higher cash flow. So I, my advice would be to evaluate your situation and basically say, do I want to get my hands there? Am I okay? Be a little bit inconvenience knowing that the, the big picture here is it will make people wealthy over time. And, uh, I'm comfortable maybe getting a uh, phone call we need to make and having to deal with the summit. But you just become resourceful and find a way to work through it. 
And I think if you're someone who maybe has another job that's much higher income and you're not willing to do that, you may need to buy property, hire a management company. But I think it just, it really depends on what your time is worth and how, how deep in the leads you want to get. I mean, when I started out, my first investors were guys that, you know, worked on Wall Street or had, you know, financial jobs and they weren't going to mess with a rehab. They weren't going to be and the all the generic RFP and anything that they were looking for someone young and hungry to partner with. So something I think we'll all agree on is that we're not in this business because we have to be in it. We're in it because we enjoy it. We like the opportunity it affords us and we like getting out of bed in the morning. It's fun. Yeah. Um, it beats going into a normal office job as I'm jokingly called, like I did for the first seven years of my career. But I think having an office job and learning those skills to lead up to doing this is sometimes essential or necessary. Uh, but what is really cool about this business, uh, one of my actual side stories I'd love to share is an inspirational note. One of my very good friends I went to college with, he was an engineer and a resourceful, smart guy, had a good job and a good income. And one of the first bigger buildings I bought had a portfolio piece to it. And I said, hey, Andy. The names have not been changed for Tech VA. <laughs> hey, Andy, I know you want to buy a Tondo. What do you think about buying this for you in an apartment building? I know the owner is selling me a 14 unit down the street. I'd be happy to set you up with it. Here's my underwriting. Here's the model. Let me be your realtor or your broker and help figure this out for you. So my friend proceeded to buy a half million dollar apartment building in Bucktown, Logansburg border in a gray area. And then he subsequently moved to the unit, did a house hack. And then, you know, within two years, bought another building, moved into that, but kept the first building, refinanced it. And I'll never forget this. This is one of those gratifying moments of my, my career, I would say. I think it was five years into buying his first building that I helped point him up with. He basically said, Gabe, I'm treating you to dinner because of you helping me buy this first building. I'm now a millionaire. Thank you. And that is something I'll never forget because by just making this, you know, sharing their passion with him and helping him do this, he was able to change the trajectory of him and his family's life. And that's a pretty powerful thing. And, you know, that building now, like I said, I think he's into it for five hundred thousand, maybe for 50 grand into it. He's looking at selling for a million dollars five years later. Did he have any real estate background prior to that? Not. So it's kind of cool. I mean, I did put the work in. Well, we, we, talk, we talked a lot last time and it's, again, it's not to pat ourselves on the back, but it's for, for most of those you folks out there that are way smarter than us and have great careers, high paying jobs, but you just are really intrigued by real estate, having friends <laughs> and yeah. people like, uh, like we will, we yeah. will, we will insulate you from, you can still make a mistake, but for the most part, we'll guide you down that path. Bring, bring a good attitude and bring some money and, and let's go. <laughs> so, that, so that's the, you know, that's the Kasani dad. Let's talk about the rainy days. What's the worst thing that's happened to you in the real estate industry, whether the fad deal, construction gone wrong? What's like, what's the warning? I actually like to let you take this. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, you get to tell the inspirational story. I have, I got like 10 of these, Alex. <laughs> Um, like what can go wrong? What's the one thing that people should be prepared for? Well, here's what I always talk about when it comes to when you're at our level of doing this, so not necessarily the secondary investor, but when you're actually the, the person doing the deals, the developer, let's call it, um, there's no, I always picture like at the circus, the net, you know, for mm -hmm. the, you know, they're not gonna die if they fall, they'll, it'll hurt, they'll sprain an ankle. Yeah. It, there is no net here. So, you know, when we do really well and everyone out there is like, oh, you made $200,000 on that deal, you guys are rich and whatever, like, there's, the, there, there's an equal and opposite reaction yeah. to that potential. There is no limit on how much you can lose if you mess up. And that's, again, that's not, I'm here doing it. I believe in real estate, but you do have to know that. Mommy and daddy aren't saving you yeah. mm -hmm. if you mess up. So how can you potentially mess up? We've all been, all three of us have been there, construction costs. So that's probably the number one most that's the biggest hurdle to the common or newer investor, right? They don't, they don't know a trustworthy GC. 
they don't, we talked last time, I hope everyone heard about contingency costs. Um, we've all been there, where we budget something and 30, 40, 50, 200% higher, yeah, I know you've been there, <laughs> is what actually happened. So number one, if you're gonna do value add, you, you really have to have trustworthy construction help. Um, number two, and this is something that I love that Gabe touched on in his first story. I feel like the three of us, we're all on the same page when it comes to f having flexibility. So you don't go into a real estate deal or purchase with only one possible outcome. You didn't buy that four unit knowing that you were gonna refi out and get 200K in equity, right? That happened, it was great, but if it didn't happen, you had another option, right? You were either gonna live in it maybe you'd fix it up and sell. You gotta have three, four, I don't even wanna say exit strategies, but just strategies. Mm -hmm. If you make a, a huge real estate purchase, it, yeah, I'm trying to think, if, if I bought the three unit on Albany and my only option was to sell it, I'm kind of fucked, right? Yeah. Mar market changed, yeah. values changed, the noise that the L is making behind it got a little bit louder. <laughs> I might have ignored that when we purchased it, it's okay. Um, but no, I, I have a couple different strategies I could back into. I, we have the ADU, I'm gonna add a unit, that's gonna bring in more rental income. I'm gonna refi, I'm gonna, you know, there, there's, there's different options. Does that kind of make yeah. sense? Move into it. Stop it. <laughs> Cut, no, <laughs> that's fine. Um, I don't know, I kind of rambled there, but does that, does that kind of answer your question? I mean, there's, there's unlimited downside, just like there's unlimited upside, but that's when, you know, in episode one, we talked about the team and the network. Gabe, I'm sure you could support me when I say like, shit, the reason you two are in the room is because you guys are part of my network. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sure you had to have a net, you didn't just go out there, cowboy Gabe, just I know fucking everything and do it on your own, right? I'm sure you had people that you looked up to and people oh, that yes. supported you along the way. Yeah, I think just finding the mentor and finding someone that you can learn from, ask questions of, that is actually interested in giving back and helping sort of that next generation, I think that's really important. Um, yeah, I think some of your comments about having multiple strategies is interesting, and I can touch on some of the, the hurdles I face, but one thing I will say is interesting, Happy worked at a bank from 2008 through 2013 and still in the turmoil in the world when, I mean, you think people maybe had a bad time during COVID. The financial crisis of 08 was Armageddon. I mean, it was, we had double digit unemployment. People were losing buildings and fast. And one thing I got to see working at a bank was different borrower profiles of different people taking out credit for real estate transactions. And the recurring theme was that people who invested in multifamily and had staggered debt maturities, meaning they didn't have all their loans rolling at once and they had a little bit more diversification in their financing, those people came out of 2008, 24, 36 month, months later, small enough groves. People that were relying on certain events happen, like I got to build it and sell it, build it and sell it. And if I don't sell it, I don't really know what I'm going to do. Uh, I recently did an investor call and a fundraise and one of my first times doing it was, you know, it was actually really fun and, and pretty interesting. But one of the questions that came up on the call was, what do you see as the biggest risk of doing this project? And it was a pretty ambitious, ground up, new construction project, a lot of debt, a lot of equity, a lot of dollars to bound, flag around. And my response to that question was the biggest risk of doing an appropriate project is not finishing because if you are unable to finish it due to cons, lack of funding or any other factor outside of control, you are not able to get it under roof certificate of occupancy and start generating cash flow. And what I saw in my experience being a lender was that people that were able to finish their projects one way or the other, you know, getting a loan from another source or the bank making what's called a protective advance, where basically a bank would see a situation where a project could be out of budget and say, all right, you've got a $10 million deal, we have an $8 million deal going, you need to have a million to finish it. Well, if we don't help you finish it, we have an empty building and that has very little value. So we're actually gonna go out and give you another million dollars just to finish it to protect the bank's position. So 
time heals most wounds and issues of real estate and cash flow and rise in rents over the long term can help solve problems. And um, I think that's just one of the one of the biggest things. Benefits to being in apartments is that as long as you can finish it you know, and get it full, you know it's it's a drag when you miss the leasing season and you finish a project in October. And unfortunately, Chicago being a seasonal market might slow down a lease up. Uh, but as long as you can carry it through the next spring and get full, in the long run, it will work out. It's just very fun. Knowing that there is a plan and a strategy and it makes it, and you have the ability to finish and fund the project. Uh, is you, you could finish a project that you made some mistakes on or you missed a season on, and then you could catch your breath. Yeah. And then you could reevaluate. Maybe you take a few bumps. It's a 12 month lease. You raise the rent. Then. You spent a little too much in construction, whatever. But to your point, you're sitting on a extremely valuable asset and you're in control of it. Yeah. So you can get with your team, your management team to switch things around. Okay, we're down to like our last minute here. Okay, give me, take the gloves off. Give me your honest answer here. So. We're in weird times right now. I think there's a decent amount of negative energy amongst our peers, certain invest people that live through the time that you're talking about. Not all of them have the outlook you have. You had, you had a pretty that kind of that kind of jet started your career in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, others were totally taken out, and they're really scared about what we're seeing right now. There's also a lot of talk just about Chicago in general between politics, crime. Okay, this isn't Chicago specific, but interest rates, taxes, there's all these potential negative events, yet here are the three of us investing heavily in Chicago. What do you see ahead for our city investing here? And be honest, are you starting to look elsewhere or, or, or do we have a, a light at the end of the tunnel here? Uh, wow. It's a lot. Yeah, that is you a lot. You have one minute, go. <laughs> yeah, I think. Being a business owner and investor requires you, if you're very group to be, as I would call the eternal optimist. People who are pessimistic will not start a business, buy a building, take a chance. I think it's just key to understand your downside and put on your, your banker hat, which is like, what could happen? What could go wrong? I think Chicago has a lot of benefits to it. Uh, I am concerned about the leadership as is everyone, and it also scares me that in spite of the issues Chicago have, we seem to keep voting in a lot the same people. No need to name names. But um, I look at the number of people that have been in this city and committed to this city in the long run and how they've performed on their investments. See, Chicago compared to some of the, the, the coastal markets or, you know, Florida, Arizona, places that are very boom and potentially bust, it's more stable. Uh, and I think if you have a long-term outlook and you're patient and you are comfortable tying up money, it will continue to match the historical trend of higher rents, higher value, and there's going to be some blitz. Um, as far as looking further afield, I think for a lot of people when they reach a certain point, that's just something they want to do to be diversified. Sure. It, it requires, I think, someone to be on the ground to really get into that local market. So the idea of going outside is not daunting, but it's definitely intriguing. And I know a lot of my friends and peers have done that. Um, but it's, you know, if, if I look at my crystal ball as in future Chicago, I look at the amount of people that I would argue are smarter than me and the more prolific investor developers than me. And they continue to invest big in Chicago. I was just at something, and you guys might have been there, at Lincoln Park Builders Forum, where one of the biggest developers in Fulton Market, very bright, very astute guy. And so I believe in this, and I am building another thousand units. And he's raising equity, and it is growing and, and making more pretty neighborhoods. So I just, in spite of the issues, I think, you know, we're a resilient city with a great economy. We are a green drive for the Midwest, and there are a lot of very smart, talented people. And I think the population of Chicago is becoming more educated and higher higher income earning. And I think also with inflation, people are making more, and they're going to pay you on rent. And so, long term, big picture, I feel good about it. But I think you know, some cautions the exercise. Awesome, Gabe. Thank you so much. This was awesome. I think we we may have gone 202 or 303 yeah, yeah, today, but I think it's I think it's honestly it's fucking awesome. I can't wait to go back and watch this. There's so much that I can take from this. Um,
For those of you out there, keep tuning in. Uh, we are, you'll have all of our contact information. We're here to help you. We're doing this so you guys could get involved in real estate investment, whether you want to do it with us or you want to do it on your own, we're a resource here for you. Alex, how you doing? It's great. Great to be surrounded by so many more people who are doing bigger and better things. I need a cigarette. <laughs> Thank you. This is really cool. Thanks, guys. See you next time.